what, looking around and seeing everybody here, and I see a lot of family, and I call everybody here family because it takes a family uh, to get a 57-year-old man to a commencement on May 14th, and that's what it's taken. So uh, it's been a long road, and, I, and I've had a long road. So um, to get you to where we started to get you here, this day means so much to me. Uh, it's, uh, it's at the top of my life, and the, there's no description I can give to y'all. And, it, and it's, uh, it's amazing that I look out here, and I know that three-fourths of this crowd has done the same path I have. It, 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 nobody has get, had education given to them. Everybody's periodically gone, or they've had to travel, or they've extended their education, or they've added to their education. Uh, uh, my father-in-law was telling me about driving back and forth to finish his PhD for four years. Uh, but to, to get started, um, I, I think mainly uh, I grew up in Pasadena, Texas. And, uh, we grew up in the ship channel. And on the ship channel, there's not really a ceiling, but Everybody has to get on the ship channel to work. If you work, if you live in Pasadena, you want to get out of those neighborhoods and you want to get a good job on the ship channel, it'll make you a good living. Half of my family makes a good living on the ship channel. Uh, my brother-in-law is here. He's been there 36 years. My brother's been here over 30 years. That's where I was going to stay. That was my goal. Uh, my grandfather uh, and John Queen, they ran every big job on the ship channel. So, as a child, a youngster, uh, I wanted to be like John Creevy. I wanted to be like my grandfather. Uh, <laughs> and I got to work as a summer helper on the ship channel with John. Uh, and I was a small, uh, a small kid. Uh, I guess my first job was about in sixth grade. Um, I mowed a man's yard uh, in my neighborhood. And uh, he got a new lawnmower and he gave me his lawnmower. So, uh, I wanted to start mowing yards, and uh, I had a little bit of a problem. I was I was pretty small, so I could get a yard lined up, but I would have to get my mom to come start it because I couldn't even start the lawn. <laughs> and, uh, you know how you have the two bars? I mowed with the bar down here, and, and, and the other bar is behind my head. And I, and I would get five dollars a yard, and if I could line up five yards in a week, I always had money in my pocket. At sixth grade, I always had money in my pocket. Uh, in the seventh grade, uh, in Houston, there's a place that's still there today. It's called Dot Coffee Shop. Uh, I work. I wash dishes at night from 11 to 7 every night. So, and went to school the next day. And uh, everybody in the class would say, "I smell onions," and I'd say, "I do too." But you know, <laughs> it was because I've been washing dishes all night. And then I would still go to school. And I was still better in, in, in sports, and, and I was good in sports. Uh, growing up in Houston, uh, I just had to get on the ship channel. And uh, being, being fortunate, my grandfather being an electrical engineer and John Cleveland was the superintendent of every big job, every summer I got to work and I would save my money in seventh and eighth grade. I always had money in my pocket. I would buy my own school clothes every year. I would help anything I could with my mom. My mom always had two jobs. Everybody in my family had two jobs. So we knew about working hard. Uh, so I, I knew that would be it. My oldest brother got an opportunity to go to uh, Mansfield, Texas to learn to be a machinist. And I worked all summer uh, on one of Johnny's jobs and saved all my money and I went and visited him. And I didn't want to go back. I thought, life outside the ship channel, maybe I could wind up in, in, in Mansfield. So, and uh, my oldest brother just told me, you're going to have to stay in school. And I. I said, man, I can get 10 jobs. He said, you gotta stay in school. So I did stay in school and I worked um, for a builder. So he would build a house and uh, he would call me and I would clean out the sheetrock. And then they would shingle it and I would clean out the shingles. And then uh, they would do the electrical and I'd clean out the electrical. And uh, I, I really think that he knew that it was me living with my brother and he never asked me any questions. He just gave me work and I worked hard for him. Um, my junior and senior year, uh, I befriended a friend of mine, David Wiley, and they owned a, a, a dairy farm, and they owned a dairy barn. So I went to high school, I played football, I ran track, but at four o'clock every morning, he and I milked cows. And if you've ever milked cows, 
or no milk cow, you should. It's just a blast. You know, you're, you're in a pit. And so when you're in a pit, you're chest high, and you wear these bibs, and you, uh, you have a water hose hooked to your bib, so you, you wash down the udders, and you put the machines on, and you milk. And, you, and these same 16 cows go in the same stalls, and we would do about 200 cows every morning before school. So my junior and senior, and, and you're in a trough, so everything you wash off the udders and everything that comes out of the cows goes in the trough. That's why you wear these bibs. So I'm knee deep in cow manure the whole time. So I would get, we would get through milking cows about 6.30. I'd run home and shower. And when I would get to class and everybody would say, I smell what happens, what happens? So it was, a, it was a whole different uh, smell. Uh, but it was a good job and it was a good honest living and in, in high school I always had money in my pocket. Um, following high school, uh, uh, I, to get into the IBW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, they, they take in 28 a year is all they take in. And so you have to apply and you apply and you apply. And uh, with uh, my grandfather helping, and luckily Johnny Cleavy was on the board, I just hoped for that call. And uh, so I actually went and ran for three schools trying to get a football scholarship. And uh, the last school I ran for, I came back to Mansfield. And, uh, and I don't know why, but I, I drove my motorcycle. And I tried to do three schools in three days. And back then, you just ran 340s. They weighed you. You did a vertical jump. You did a, a broad jump. And that was about it. But I, I took some track film, and I thought I had a chance. And, but when I got back to town, I got hit by a truck on my motorcycle, and it uh, crushed my forefoot, so that was out. So it was funny about having a family, because my last football game, living with my brother, I had broke my hand my junior year. And so my, I wore a pad on it. So my senior year, uh, second to last game, I broke my arm. So my mom's living in Pasadena, and I'm living with my brother in Fort Worth. So I got tackled and I hurt my arm break and they had so much tape on it, my hand was touching my shoulder pads. And uh, so I looked at it and I said, well, so when we made a huddle, they, they would do a U shape and the quarterback would kneel down and call the play and I would stand behind him so they couldn't see the play call. So he's kneeled down calling the play and I tapped him on the helmet and I said, I broke my arm. He passed out. <laughs> So my coach looks out, got the quarterback down and the tailback down. He's passed out with my hands on my shoulder tail. So they get me to the sideline and they're out there with smelling sauce. You know, they're running by me because they gotta get the quarterback. And they get him up with smelling sauce and they sit me down and uh, they're getting a hold of uh, somebody to get me to the hospital. Took me on to the hospital and uh, I told everybody, call my mom because I'm living with my brother. So we get to the hospital, and they x-ray and they said his arm's broke, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta sign this release and get his arm set. So the girls came in, and it was a Friday night, Friday night football, and my mom was at work, and so she wasn't answering the phone, we didn't have cell phones back then, this is 1978. So um, it just shows about family like I'm talking about tonight, because this is what happened. I'm in there with the doctor, and somebody else's mother comes in. <laughs> she goes, I'm his mother. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'm covered. Until another lady flies in. I'm his mother. <laughs> and so the doctor looks up, and then right about then, the girls have got a hold of my mom, and they come in, and they said, we got his mom on the phone. <laughs> so that was how fast my family grows. It, Three mothers stepped up right then. Uh, so that got me to uh, my motorcycle wreck. This time I had to have my mom. They, they life lied me. And, uh, and they wanted my mom to sign an amputee form. And she wouldn't sign it. So they, uh, and that's when they life lied me to Houston. And uh, they saved my leg. And uh, all the game green went out. They, they did a lot of uh, skin grass. And, uh, and they just sit there and they would never walk the same or never run the same. And I worked so hard that summer that 
but I actually played semi-pro with the four four stars the last four games of that season, that same year. So that's how fast I came back. And I remember when we got up, we were called the four four stars because the Dallas Cowboys had donated their equipment to us. And when I got my helmet, it had Clint Longley's signature in it. If y'all remember Clint Longley. And I just thought, man, that was just too cool. I thought, well, I'm out of that. Uh, and then that fall of May, Johnny called me, John Quigley called me and said, you're in the IBW. And that gets you into a trade. It gets you a five-year commitment. You work 712s on any job on the ship channel you want to. You go to school two nights a week, um, 7,200 hours in the John. Uh, every six months you're tested. If you don't pass, you're out. So when they take you in 28, you get about 18 of us will make it. And, uh, but that gave me an electrical license. And when I got out of that five years, I had an electrical license that could take me anywhere. And it gave me two things to do. I could make a good living, and I have done electric work my whole life since that license, and I don't think I've ever charged anybody. So uh, any single mother, anybody that's ever needed anything, I've done their electric work. And I, and I still do today. Um, but taking that same license, and I didn't realize how big it was. I went to General Motors and I put down my electrical license and they went through my folder. Uh, 7,200 hours, a five hour commitment. And the biggest thing that they had, I had five years of perfect attendance. In five years, I never was late or missed a night of class. I never was late or missed a day of school. And the man at General Motors, I mean, this is the head guy, he folded my folder and said, he wrote, hire this man. And General Motors hired me right then and there. I worked hard for General Motors about two and a half years. I took a test for robotic technology they were starting. And 33 of us scored high enough that we went to Doraville, Georgia and installed 370 robots and made an automated plant. So when you program robots, like when they do spot well, you have eight of them. You can put one in repair, say if two's down, one will do its job and half a two's, three will do its job and the other half a two's while you're working on two. These are the kind of things we program. And uh, it, it was a good five years, it was a good experience, but my electrical license got me that job with General Motors. Uh, but being that you can go anywhere you can go, I was hearing about General Dynamics, the, the F-16 fighter jet. They were working 714s, and it was just very tempting. So when I came back from Georgia, they told me, well, you took a leave, now you're going to be on night shift at General Motors in Arlington. I was back in Arlington. I said, well, how long? And they said, probably about 10 years. So I took my IBW license again, and I took my perfect attendance, and I took my five years of perfect attendance at General Motors. I had certificates for that. And I went to Brian Stanton, sitting right here at General Dynamics. Brian Stanton read it, and he said, I've never had an application with anybody that's never missed a, job, a day of work before. Brian hired me. Brian and I worked together for five years. We had a good time with him, Brian. And, uh, but there was something I didn't tell Brian. I was still working second shift at 10 and <laughs> And I, and I thought, you know, just, just to get my 90 days in. So, uh, and I had, I had two hours in between. So my lunch kit was as big as a podium and I had to change badges. <laughs> and I just, uh, and I did that and, and 90 days flew by. And I don't know, I guess it was about five months later and I was still working day shift general dynamics for the F-16 fighter jet, uh, night shift general motors, uh, bit of the Tahoe. Uh, I was in charge of the pin insertion robots. That was my training, and Brian had me on the mezzanine. He said, I need you to get your top security clearance. I said, what for? He said, we got a big project coming in behind the North Wall. So Brian and I go from the domestic side to the military side, and we do our top security clearance. And it's just amazing if you take 60 people, two of us passed. I mean, that's how deep they check your oil. So, so now Brian and I are working together in the north side in the top security area. And Brian says, uh, uh, Secret Service wants to see you. And I said, okay, we usually about insurance or something. So I go back to the military side and I walk in this room. 
and there was about six men in there staring at me. And they said, uh, have you ever heard about conflict of interest? And I said, I have. Are you working at General Motors? <laughs> I said, I am. So I had to make a choice. So uh, I, had, I showed General Dynamics. They had a lot of F-16 going on. They made me terminate General Motors that night. So for four and a half months, I did work GDM, I guess you could say, changing badges every night. Uh, following General Dynamics with Brian, uh, it, it was coming to a slow, uh, and Bell Helicopter was fired up. So I went over with my paperwork and my identity license, and I got on that Bell Helicopter. And as General Dynamics phased out, I went to work for Bell Helicopter. And I worked downstairs in their test cells. And they would run, they were developing a tilt over at the time, and they would run to fail. They would just run to see what gave up first and video it. And, but when I left General Dynamics, they said, you have an option for, for school. We'll send you to any school you want for a certain amount of hours. Uh, so I chose biomedical technology because I had also just joined the Naval Reserve and I was put into a corpsman group. And we would put together mash units, mock-up mash units, and they would parachute them into Camp Pennington or uh, Puerto Rico or Guam, and we would go in and we would build a mash unit. So I was liking what I was doing, so I took my general dynamics option and joined Texas State Technical College in Waco, Texas. So I worked at Bell Helicopter during the day and would drive 50 miles to Waco every night four nights a week and go to class. And that's how I got my uh, certification in med uh, medical technology. So when I was getting out, I didn't know if I was going to stay at Bell Helicopter or not. <clears throat> so uh, when I was getting out of class, a lot of people was coming to interview us, kids that was graduating, except that I was in my 30s, and they kept interviewing me. And they just kept in I was the only in the class that interviewed. And uh, I, I didn't know if I was the oldest guy or what. So I kind of flipped it and interviewed them. Well, why is it that you need me so bad? Well, this is very important. We get paid by the day, by the piece of equipment, in the people's house. It has to be run. So I stayed for two more months and did the oxygen therapy because I found out that's where the money was at, oxygen concentration in people's houses. So when I got out, I either had the chance to go back to Bell Helicopter or I took my electrical license, I went back to the ship channel, and I went to work for Uni Carbide, and they had a big shutdown going 24 hours a day. So I chose the 7 p.m. to the 7 a.m. shift. And in the daytime, I went to my mother, who had just retired, and said, I want to start a medical business. And uh, I hired the best two kids in my class that went with me, and we started Ray Medical. And the reason I call it that, it wound up being three different businesses. So we ran that for about, what, Mom, about two years, and uh, we finally had to get paychecks and CPAs. We had to get people to help us out. We were growing so fast. And, uh, and I think that we didn't do anything much different. I just think we took care of our patients better. And I had applied for a provider number so I could do the oxygen therapy. So in two years, our CPA said, your business can afford you. Why don't you get off the ship camera? So I uh, went to Union Carbide and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give my two-week notice and start it. Um, I, I had started my own business and I'm going to work for it. And they all said, but he does our calibration. So the plant manager said, can you take that with you? So there was another business. I started the calibration business and that was in my medical business. And so uh, my little sisters, uh, Rhonda and Renee, they worked the floor, they stopped, they did everything, they drove vans for me, they did everything. But my clientele was nurses, and I would do in services, sometimes for five to 800 nurses. And uh, it's just, I would be in line with 10 other companies that I do in service. And I, I got lucky a couple of times, and I landed a couple of very big uh, uh, contracts with nursing agencies. And so they started, uh, I moved to a bank building, and I had a lobby this big, and we filled up full of nurses' clothing. So we started that business. We started selling nurses' supplies and clothing. And within five years, uh, 
I guess we have about, what, 4,000 pieces of nurses' clothing and material. Uh, I had 750 patients with my equipment in their houses. And once you pass 500 patients, you become public knowledge. So these companies noticed that they had big companies, but I had a lot of patients uh, in their, they had multiple stores. And I had a lot of patients in their areas. So within three months, uh, I had my, the three largest competitors in Houston run a due diligence to my company and uh, made me a phenomenal offer just to cash out and do a no compete. And uh, I was still doing the calibration business at night, you know, so I, I've got a van, I'm dropping off oxygen and porta potties, and I'm doing all I can do, and I'm going down to do the calibration. And I dropped the contract off at Johnny Quigley's house. And uh, so I dropped him off, I said, just read it, put it in the mailbox, I'll come back by. And uh, so I'm coming home, it's about 11.30 at night, and Johnny said, take the money. He just gave me the contract and said, take the money. And, uh, and so during this time, across the hall from us was TSO. And I always just had to have something in my eye and go over there, because Dr. <laughs> Hilton was over there. <laughs> and and the, their girls were always telling our girls, you need to date Dr. Hilton. You need to date Dr. <laughs> so I just stick stuff in my eye and, 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 and go over there. Because they got to get this close to look at you. So it was pretty cool. And, uh, so, so we started dating, and we dated a lot, and I have a lot of pictures. I mean, we, she loved to travel, and we talked it out. We talked and didn't talk and talk. But during the 45 day business, uh, I had to leave about 10 different days a day. She said, no, this isn't a very day. So uh, finally, we sold the business, and then Jackie and I got to date permanently. And you know, it was a cool thing for her parents. So she called, and she said, uh, especially when we were dating early, well, we went out to dinner and they say, well, did he stay the night? No, he works at Union Carbide on that. So, <laughs> there were no bad stories, so he, he was working. Uh, so, uh, we, we just had a good relationship. And uh, so, I uh, sold all three businesses in 45 days. And I was out. And uh, so, uh, I needed to find something to do. And uh, Johnny had a mutual friend. Uh, we went to see him in Oklahoma. He had three different businesses, and he got me into storage building businesses. So I went to Lake Granbury, and uh, we purchased uh, two pieces of property. And Jackie told me she would go anywhere that I went. So I had a commitment from her that she would go anywhere that I went. That meant a lot to me. So you see the pictures. I go to Granbury, and we're pouring 440-foot slabs. We're erecting buildings. We're building this is where we live. We're building, building. Here's Jackie coming. We get the sign. We got the storage building, 54 feet in the air, eight foot by 40 foot. We did that together. Uh, she's still working at TSO in Pasadena. I'm in Granbury, Texas, building storage buildings. So we had to start talking about being serious. And she told me it's a heck of a commute, and uh, I understood that. So we talked about being married, and I thought, now that I can slow down with this storage building, I need to concentrate on getting married. So uh, she came in one night, and I said, we got to go somewhere uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning. And we have done this a few times. So she drove in one night on a Friday night, and she got in late, and I know she wasn't looking forward to it, but I got her at 5 o'clock in the morning, because we used to go to the railroad trusses on Lake Granbury, and, uh, the swallows, if y'all have ever seen the swallows, they build those mud nests and they're married for life. The two swallows, they work. They go to the water, they get a beach full of mud, they come back, they spit that mud out, and they lay it like, a, like an engineer. Have y'all seen what I'm talking about, the mud nests, the swallows? And, and we would park the boat and watch them. So it was just a cool old wooden railroad trussel. So, uh, what, I get her up at 5 o'clock in the morning because you got to get there when they break out because they're working and they're, they're working pairs. They're paired up, they're working, they're, one lays a brick this way, one overlaps it the other way. So I had a pretty fast boat. I go down to the marina, I get her in there, and we're hauling across the lake. And uh, I'm heading right to the railroad trusses, and I turn the motor off, and we're coasting up under the railroad trusses. 
and I wanted her to pay attention to this. I said, look at the swallows. They're, they're together for life. They're building their house together. They're overlapping. They're picking each other's slack. And when they make two trips to the other trip, but they're making these nests together. They're building this together for life. And they do it together every year. And then I asked her, I said, would you be interested in doing something like that? Well, when she turned around, I was on one knee. And I had a ring in my hand. And I'm over 100 feet of water, so I'm kind of nervous. And I asked her if she'd marry me, and she said she would. So that was how I proposed to Daphne. And as fast as my boat was, she said, you, we didn't have a cell phone. She said, you need to get me back. I need to call my mom. So, uh, we hauled back so she could call her mother. And uh, uh, we got married at Miller's Crossing. We, we were visiting Nanny. She had her, her grandmothers in her 90s. We were visiting her parents. And uh, that takes us to Miller's Crossing. And uh, John Cleavey, my best man, Michelle Evans here, was, was her maid of honor. They stood beside us. Her mother played the piano. Her dad gave it away. It was a family event right here at Miller's Crossing. It was a great event. Um, and during that time visiting uh, on Wild Hair, I, I bought a 100 acre farm in Martinsville. <laughs> so I bought a farm. So there's all the pictures of our animals. We had such a good time on the farm. And, and, and we reminisced about so many things. And, and we raised animals together and we worked. And the day that we decided to move to, I was in the, my, my second storage buildings. And I told Jacqueline, if, they, if we get another buyout, we're moving to the farm. And we got another buyout. So we sold all of our storage buildings and moved to the farm. And we got here on a Thursday, and she went to see Dr. Lehman on a Friday to ask about employment opportunities in, in Nacogdoches, Texas. She started Monday. <laughs> so uh, he, the situation just worked out. So we moved in the Fedonia Hotel for four and a half months. And I moved all of our stuff up here. And uh, into the barn, built us a house. And every day, Jack would help me build our house. And uh, he was a very educated guy. We would come back from the farm. Instead of going back to the house, he would take me through SFA. He would say, you need to get a, work, you need to get a job here. You need to work at SFA. You can work here, and you can get an education here. And he told me his story. And then he told me Nanny's story. Nanny was a, came here in 1931 and graduated in 1934. Jack and his wife did double, edu double education here. All three of their daughters went to school here. I'm the 10th degree in his, in his immediate family. Their immediate family started with Nanny. Uh, so it was just a big deal. But I tell you, every day, if we went to lunch, he drove me through SFA. You need a good job here. He needs you right there. There's a light out. You can get a job here. You can go to, you can go to school here. You can get an education here. And so then he told me his, his flight on his education, it started out, and he worked every summer, and he paid as he went. He paid every semester as he went. He didn't have a phone yet. He didn't have the parents to call. And he told me how he did that. And he told me he worked in his, in his master's and then his doctor. And again, I was just thinking, I, I don't really want to do that. I just, I, I can make a job as an electrician. But he was on me. He pushed me, he pushed me to get in here. So instead, I went, where's David McCarty? David's right here. I took my IBW license, my General Motors, my General Manic, my big folder. I went to David McCarty. He hired me as a ship electrician on Norbert, right here on, on the loop. And now I'm working at Norbert. And he, I got my 90 days in. David got me as a ship electrician. We're good, won't we, David? He got, we're good, got me in the slot until I get a call from SFA. Okay. Well, back then you did it different. You did your resume and you took it to the physical plant. That's what I did. Uh, and uh, John Ross had read my physical, had read my uh, resume, and he called me and said, a man named Tommy Wells was going to call me. And I said, okay. Well, David had, at Norbert, David started a softball team. And I, we were playing softball at night, and I broke my arm. <laughs> so Tommy called me for an interview. So uh, we're in Martinsville. I went down to the barn, and I soaked my cast until it got soft enough, and I took my cast off. 
And I went to interview him. And I didn't know I was going to do this. And he goes, Tommy Wales. And, and, I'm just, and I had to shake about 50 people's hands that day with a broke arm. And uh, so when Jack and Lane comes home from work, first thing Jackie says is, where's your cast? I told you the good news. I had an interview at SFA. <laughs> Where's your cast? I said, I couldn't even get the cast on. So we go to the emergency room. They wouldn't put another cast on because they had to x-ray to make sure it was set. Well, I had already been to my local veterinarian that day, and I knew that my bone was set, but they still wouldn't do it. So we had, what, it was at 11, 12 o'clock. We get home that night with a new cast. And then Tommy calls me for my second interview. <laughs> so about two weeks later, I'm down there in the pedal car. And I had to soak my cast off, get my cast off. And uh, I go back in, and I just thought I was going to sign some paper. But no, we got to go to every shop. Come away! Come away! And, it, and it's, it's like grabbing a 220 wire when you got a broke arm. And, uh, and I didn't get another cast then, I was young. And uh, so that started my start at SFA in 2003. So I was, and, uh, and I was down at the bar one day, uh, and I knew that now I had to tell David that I was leaving, and uh, we had a good, a good talk. He, 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 he was all right with it. And uh, I started with SFA. And I was down at the barn one day, where my cast was, and I thought I was going to make one of those little uh, mud nests for Jacqueline to be romantic. But you got to have a beat. Everything I made was rain, and it just didn't work out. So I didn't make her a nest. Um, so that didn't work out. Uh, but I did get on an SFA, and uh, where Tommy had me offered. And so then I talked to John. And they came up with a way where I could work in the electrical department and the electronic department. And I could carry two pagers. And then there was supposed to be a race coming up in September. And they talked it up pretty good. So the second interview, I did take the job. And uh, I started at SFA. And I did get to work in both departments. And I had a blast. And uh, I worked my way up. And I had two promotions in about a year. And I was just could not be any better. And my family grew, and it grew, and it grew. I knew everybody, and everybody helped. And we, we all were on faith, first name basis, and everything was going well. Well, there was a, a, a fire alarm school, and it was going to come to Lufkin. It was going to be local. And I went to John Ross, and I said, John, I need to take this class. And he read this class to me, and he said, Tell me about your business in Pasadena. So I told him, and he said, so you can manage people. I said, yeah, we have about 23 employees. He said, well, I want you to work on your undergrad. And I said, well, what do I got to do? He said, I'm going to send you to a friend of mine. And he sent me to Dr. Stanley. And he was a friend of John's because when I got over there, Dr. Stanley treated me like he had known me for 20 years. And he got out a pencil and paper and I had a contract, it's a binding contract. He hand wrote my contract and he walked me over to Rust Building and he got me signed in. And uh, going back to TSTC and uh, some other schools I went to, it had been 10 years, so I had to take my cash test again. <laughs> so I actually got with Jackie's dad and we studied the test test. And I went in the first time and I scored high enough and I Accepted. And so that was 2007. So my first class uh, was well, the road for 2008. And we were working a lot of time in SFA at that time as well. But Jack uh, said, uh, let's knock that math out first. <laughs> so our first few classes are called algebra. And uh, let me tell you, that's when you got to have a friend. Jack has got that kind of brain that made it. We made a billion more passes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, we moved, and we moved on. So getting back to Dr. Stanley's contract, I'm, I'm reading it one day, and I'm thinking, this is going to take 10 years. <laughs> and I was like in my second year, and I'm just taking one class a semester. And, I, and I'm not sure uh, if it was Mr. Ross uh, who started the physical plant scholarship. But they actually support you for one class a semester. 
And I could do some, I could do spring and fall, and then Jackie and I would pay for summer one, summer two. So it's a great program. I'm not really sure who started it, but I know John signed my first one, and Lee Britton signed my last one. And, and that was a great, great thing. It, it paid for half my education, and they, and they got me through that. So that was a long road, but during those nine years, I was about halfway one time, and you know, you, you think that you're just doing your job and nobody really knows what your job is. And then you can like run into the president of the college or the president's of the college and they ask you, what class are you in? Who's your, who's your professor? And I, got, I went home to Jackie. I, I can't, I can't, I'm going to have to finish this. <laughs> Everybody's asking about it. So uh, John signed them until he left and Lee signed the rest of them. And I'll tell you, uh, we work a lot of hours, and uh, you, 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 it's only two hours a week. I mean, Tuesdays is an hour and 15 minutes, and Thursdays is an hour and 15 minutes. So that's for nine years. But Ron Watson would come in with a piece of paper, and he would say, we owe you. Don't feel bad about going to school. You're, you're six to six. You're going to school. We owe you. Don't. Don't feel like you're taking it. I felt bad. I said, I can't go to school. I had taken all the night school they had. Now I said, I have to, I have to take a day class. And, and he would show me a pencil and paper. You start here, you leave here, we owe you. And that, without that feeling, I don't know if I could have gone to school during the day and felt, and felt like I was doing the right thing. But I, I, I felt like I did. And it got through. And it was just uh, the, the road. It was the road. And you know, it was just... It was, it was funny how it went, and just like in the, the top security clearance with Brian, when he got me that, when I had my, my, my medical business, NASA called me one time and they said, uh, do you option therapy? Does anybody in your company have a top security clearance? I just happened to. So I got to go do the test sales underneath NASA, and they would grow wheat. They would have 300 feet of wheat, and there would be an astronaut staying there for 90 days, and they would live on the oxygen that the wheat would grow. But in case their O2 saturation got low, they would go to an O2 concentrator for relief, and that's what I provided. So that's the kind of things, as a family, the people are helping out that got me stuff like that. I mean, that was just a call out of the blue, and, and, and I'll just never, I'll never figure out how things like that come my way. The farm was huge to us. We did so much there. We, we still do a lot. I owe so much to the IBW. Uh, my grandfather pushing me, John Quigley pulling me. They got me in there. Um, and now that I'm at SFA, it's been nine years. I've been here 13, but the nine years of school has been such a plus because during those nine years, uh, I've had a few challenges. And, uh, and I realized, I actually had to realize to myself, I had to tell myself I could not do this by myself, that uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was tough. But if it came to school, everybody stepped up. Everybody in this room, half the people in this room stepped up. Uh, the language would be so gracious, they would just say, Jeff, you take care of Ray. Uh, I had a class, people would carry my books, they would help me. And I got along, and I would recover, and I would come back. And, and, and since oh wait, it was about every two years, I, I, I would be sick for a while. Uh, but my main thing, I did not want to miss any school. And I only missed two classes. Uh, I, five, I had five surgeries in, in, uh, since oh wait, and I, I only missed two classes. Uh, and I'm not, I, I have walked in and scared quite a few folks. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a surgery. Uh, uh, now the first few surgeries were tough, now, I'll admit, but we got very good at recovering. And uh, Dr. Weber is my surgeon, he's a fantastic surgeon. Uh, Dr. Satir was the first one in LA you know, when we discovered this and worked this out. And with Dr. Satir and, and Dr. Langan, they got me to MD Anderson and they got me on the right track. So we got very good at recovering. Uh, and, and mine is, uh, you, you can tell by the banner, I don't mess around. When I get it, it's always stage four. I, I don't start at the bottom, I start at the top. Uh, so they do a radical. They always take 100% of my margins. Uh, so I would be in some pretty bad shape sometimes. And, uh, but if it came to school, 
everybody here would step up and come to me and say, what do we got to do to get you in class? Well, uh, I had a, I was in a, a World War II class, and it was a tough class. I, I had two years added to my service when I got out of this class. Uh, and that was on Monday. And I woke up Monday night, and, and I know the routine. You got to get your laps in and get out to get released. So Dr. Weber said, you're trying, you're trying to get out. I said, yes, sir, I'm in school. So Dr. Weber and Jackie talk all the time. I'm like Grandpa in the corner, you know. What are you going to do with him, you know? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, you can take care of him. And they don't even look at me, you know. They're just, well, you can get him home, and you can change the, and the, the bandages out. They stick these bandages down, these holes, and change them out. And Jackie, by that time, this was the fifth time she had taken care of me. She was very good at it. So we left. We drove, uh, uh, they, we got out at 11 o'clock on Wednesday night. We drove all night, and I was in Thursday morning's class. But I was kind of messed up on this side, and I had a sling on, and we took our ace bands, and we hid my, my drains, so they couldn't see my drains. But my my scar was pretty tough, so I wore a big Hawaiian shirt, you know, and I was, I was trying to get in, and I was, and Jeff was carrying my briefcase full of books, and uh, he didn't say anything about her walking in. But when I come walking by, he kind of caught a roll that way. And before I left, I said, Dr. Tate, I'm going to miss it a few days. And Dr. Tate said, well, you can't miss a few days. I said, well, I'm going to have a little surgery. He said, well, you need to get you a note taker. And I said, okay, I'll get a note taker. So I walked in with Jackie. And uh, so I walked by. He said, and I don't know what, he, and he called a roll that way. He goes, Robertson. He goes, well, how bad was it, Robertson? And I just stopped. I didn't know what to do. It was Jackie and I am. She said, go show them. <laughs> so I dropped about four buttons and I went up to him. I didn't want to show the class and I just pulled my shirt back and Dr. Tate goes, bad enough. <laughs> so, so she took notes that day and then she said, she told me the Bible we can see. I got to go back to work. So uh, it was just amazing. Uh, Karen Monta stepped up, uh, took notes. Judy McDonald showed up, took notes. We got through World War II. Uh, tough class. Then we signed up for Roman history. I don't know why we did. But, uh, it was an option. And, you know, it was, and, and, and I had to feel, or I'm going to wind up going 20 years. I've I got to get this done. So it was an option, so we took it. And, uh, you know, Kyle's been to Rome. Kyle said, yeah, for that ain't all. You know, we meet at the round table and we study. But Judy and I carried my books that entire semester. Every day. And there was a lot of books. And there was a lot of note taking, a lot of handwriting. And uh, she uh, would not quit. And she was very diligent because it was about school. If it would have been about me working on my hot rod, I don't think anybody in here would be there. But if I mentioned school, I bet half of y'all would be involved in this. And that's what Judy might be. And uh, so with my vacation and my time, I would go do my chemo. I would work all day on Wednesday, and then Wednesday afternoon I would go and do my chemo at night so I could get a full work day in and then drive back that night. So Thursday was tough. I would have to do a half a day vacation so I could get my class in. So I would work all day Wednesday, go to Indiana and do the chemo at night, text everybody on the way back, get back, wake up the next morning, go pick up Judy Mac, and we'd go to class. Well, I had a pretty bad uh, treatment. Some, something uh, on this one chemical uh, didn't do good, and I was driving back, and I called Jackie, and, and I, she had to talk to me from Livingston on home. I said, I don't, I don't know if I can drive in. So we talked and all the way from Livingston to get me home. So Thursday morning, I get up and I'm tired and I didn't feel good and I'm getting dressed and I run to pick up Judy Mac and I pick her up and I realize I left my books at home and I, and I don't ever want to be late to class and I, uh, and I just thought I was going to cry out. I said, Judy, I had a bad treatment, I had a bad night, I barely made it back. I said, and I left my books at home. We got everybody to get the books, we're going to be late. And, and she'll tell you, I take the stairs, I don't take the elevator. And uh, so I knew going back to my house and getting my books and getting uh, and, and taking the stairs, I was going to be late to class. And it was really frustrating me. And she could see it in my face. So I pull up the driveway and I run in and I get my books and I come out. And there's my suburban going out my driveway. 
All I saw was two hands on the steering wheel. I didn't see, I didn't see a head. She, she was back in the, the suburban, and it's a long suburban, and she got the passenger side to my side, and I'm looking down at her, and she's looking at me, and she said, I got this. Get in the car. We're going to drive straight there. We're going to take the elevator, and we're going to be on time. So the next thing she asked me, how do I adjust this seat? So she got herself back up. She drove me to class, we cut the liberal arts, uh, and got on the elevator, shot across the walkway, and we were two minutes ahead of class. So that's the kind of things people do when it comes to school, when it comes to class. I don't think it could be done any other way, and I couldn't have done it with that everybody here. But that's the kind of story that I said. And um, uh, I just had so many people think, and uh, I can't, uh, there's just no way I can. I, I, I want to mention like the, the Evans and the co and the Queens and the Lake and the Duncans, my, my little sister drove on. There's not always a room at the Rotary, the, the Rotary House. They, they, they house us when we go down. We get tested every three months. So those are the kind of folks that help in that family. So this whole room is just made up of families. Um, uh, there, there's just so many dreams that's came true this week. You know, uh, uh, I, I took my military uh, history. I took it to John Fontenot. He said, I got it. He said, I got it. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, he said, come see me, my brother. And he gives me my stole that I wore today. And if y'all saw how amazing that stole is, it's just, it's, it's like crown of the prince. I just could not be, believe that he put that on me. And I thought I was getting a pen, you know, or something, or a, a, you know, a little grenade. I didn't know what I was going to get, but it was just amazing to me. Uh, but to get me through that, and, and, and just coming through our, our, our story here, and I want everybody to sign this bottle one here. I, 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 I want this to be signed by everybody. But just coming through all the stuff that we have done, I couldn't have been more honored than right here. I, I got the President's Award. And you know, they don't give a lot of them out. And so uh, I was very surprised, I was very caught off guard. That meant a lot to me. And it hangs in my office every day, except for tonight. I actually want people to see it. Uh, coming across here, I had worked so many functions at the school that I had never even been to the ring desk. I had just heard about it. So when I went there the first time, uh, it's because I'm a senior now. I've been a senior for four years, so I thought, well, I'll go ahead and get mathematically, I'm going to graduate, so I went ahead and got my ring. Uh, and so getting my ring, it meant a lot to me. So I asked my father-in-law to be there because he's the one that got me in this in, in, in the beginning. So we're in the arts. I mean, I'm Robertson. So we're back there. We're, I'm, and and, and uh, he had gone to school in 1965, and he had not seen the Baker Trail Civic Center, so I was getting a tour. And it's getting close to time. And I said, I'm in the arts. We're all right, you know. And I, 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 they go to the back, and I'm sitting down, and I'm in the back, and, and they start talking about the mental dipper, which I did not know about. And uh, so they're describing this guy. He said, the first thing we give out every year is, is the mentor. And, and, and this is a person. And they start describing this person. Well, man, I'm sitting up. I'm saying, really, heck, have we got him? I, I, I'm kind of looking around. And I'm thinking, God, no, this guy has got it going on. And they're going to give him a ring for it. And, uh, and then the, uh, uh, Craig was reading out. and said, he came to work here in 2003. And then, they started to say more, and I thought, I'm going to have to get up. <laughs> and uh, luckily, since I had not been to a ring dip, I Googled it the night before, and I seen Hardy Meredith's ring dip. Uh, so I knew the steps, and to get off in there deep and show the purple hand. So that's what I did. And I actually had my towel with me. I've kept it with it this whole time. Uh, we've got to tour. We do SFA. I've been very proud of this. Uh, John Ross started this perfect attendance uh, for the physical plant. And all that I've been through, I've always used my own time. I've never, ever had to go to a pool of, work, of hours. I've used my own vacation, my own comfort, my own sick leave. I've never had to go to the pool. But I just, I'm proud that since this was a target, I wanted to be the guy that had perfect attendance. And when having that perfect attendance, it gave me a pool of hours to do what I've done 
with my own time. So I want to let on there, guys. That meant very, very lot to me. Uh, and, and just going through, uh, Chris Evans right here, he made me this Christmas tree, and he cut out pictures of all of our vacations and put in the, the Christmas ornaments. And I was sick. I was going, uh, I think I was doing radiation this Christmas. So uh, the Evans sisters, uh, they were all Jenkins, the Warby sisters, we were all vacation together. They all came and decorated our house because they know how much it means to have our house decorated during Christmas. And Chris had made me this Christmas tree. And that's part of the SFA family. They, they went to school with Jackie and we've all been together. So my SFA life starts from the day I met Jackie. And it starts with her family. And then it starts with this whole family right here. It starts from my first class. And uh, it gets to my last class with Dr. Lane. And we talk about it being my last class. Now, it was almost funny to us every day because you, you, you're serious and you're taking a test that we meet each other It's the last class. You know, we, we, we both still knew it, you know. It was still, it was still a, a good class, but it's cool, you know. It's, it's going to be my last class. We went, we went over that over and over and over. And uh, it was really nice to be sporting a, a, an average uh, that kept me on my GPA. And uh, with some of the labs that I had to go through uh, when I was doing my night chemo, I had to miss some labs. And uh, so my GPA, I'm a little over 3.2 right now. And I just, and just kind of really thought, man, if it hadn't been for that, those labs, because I was doing chemo at night, my GPA could have been higher. So I was just looking at it, you know, it, on the, the, the uh, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, cum laude, and they got the 3.2 cafe laude. That's all I got. <laughs> so, but that was, it was, it was 3.2. It was a little over 3.2, so I'm still proud of that. But I just want to thank my whole family that's here. And that's what got me in 2016, uh, May 14th tonight. Everybody in here that I'm seeing face to face with is the reason I got to this. Uh, and I couldn't have done that. But the one thing that everybody has to have, they gotta have that rock, they gotta have that phone friend, and that's my wife. Every class, she's supported me in every class I've done, every work I've done. She's never asked a question about anything. If I come home with a new pair of shoes, I can say, but it's for school. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. See, you know, I don't know shoes. They're for school. <laughs> so that's what it is. Um, and to live and to have life, and I feel myself fill back up the life, I, I think it fills up with purple. And with that happening, this, this week could not even have got better. Uh, uh, Harold and Carol Hall walked into my office uh, a week ago and they said they wanted to do a scholarship in my name. And I had never heard of, I had just been the one to want to help other, other folks. And I wanted to be the one to donate. And they came in and offered that. That, that really locked me up. And uh, I didn't know what to think about that. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a heart to heart thing right there. That's something that uh, you don't write down, and you, don't, you don't vision it, you, you, you take it from your heart and you give it to a heart. And I never thought I'd ever have my name on a scholarship. So um, with that being done, uh, I had to absorb that. So Mr. Hall said, I'm going to go talk to Edward Smith. And I said, okay, and then I'll follow the next day. So uh, I'm pretty excited that I'm going up there to tell April about what Mr. and Ms. Hall had just done. And uh, so I guess they all had a meeting to make me cry because she said, well, we're going to do another scholarship. And it's your SFA family of another sort. And they got together with this scholarship. And they started this one. So. At 57 years old, I'm walking the stage and I'm capping off another point in my life. And now to see my name on the scholarship is one thing, but to see my name on two scholarships is really overwhelming and it's uh, heartfelt 
Yeah, it, it's a heartbreak too. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's just too much. So I don't know how to, to thank y'all. I don't know how to react to y'all. But uh, it, it's just a big thing. Uh, I went to a funeral last week, and uh, I ran into Vivian that I went to high school with. And she said, we got to find a school for my son. I said, send him to us. We've had four kids live with us and, and go to school at SFA. And uh, she told me about Reed looking for a school. Reed came the next week uh, uh, to tour the campus. And now he's enrolled. So we got us a new SFA student right here. So the family still grows. And that's what it's all about. And that's all I want to tell you all tonight. What do you got, Gina? When are we going to start the last one? I'll tell you about that. Jackie came in and she thought we'd got some new furniture, but it was our breakfast room that's been covered up in books for nine years. So she got her breakfast room back. Uh, the brick of the round table, my gosh, we have beat on that round table. Oh my gosh, that round table has had, we've had, it seats eight, we've had eight in it before. And uh, we've actually had eight opinions before, so it's been a tough pass at some time, uh, but we've worked it out. But really, the main thing is she got her round table back. Um, and, and now that we've had this break, I want y'all to know we have a cake back here. And, and I want to cut the cake, and I want everybody to have a, a piece of this um, commencement cake. It's uh, it's made with love. This is the cake. Is this the cake? Yeah. <laughs> Jared here tonight. Uh, I need to play in. Yes. Just giving you this. They couldn't be here tonight. He asked me at the open here. Okay. I don't know what it is. Okay. I hope Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, this certificate verifies participation at SFA Walk of Recognition. So it looks like they're going to do a brick in my name for the class of 2016. So the family grows. Distinguished guest, my mother here. She's been my mother for 57 years. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I just want to thank everybody that's came here tonight, and I hope I have not left anybody out. But everybody's face here that has touched me, please feel me touch you back. Anything I can ever do, one call does it all. Just let me know. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, let's do this some more. So now that everybody knows each other, let's mix and mingle, let's go cut the cake, and we'll put some wild love music. If you notice, I've played both kinds of music, not wild and love. So we'll get that going again, and uh, let's all get up, mix and mingle, have some cake.
I'm a long, tall Texan I wear a tin gallon hat He rides from Texas with a tin gallon hat Yes, I'm a long, tall Texan I wear a tin gallon hat That's your hat. He was from Texas with a tin gallon hat. Well, I'm a long, tall Texan. I ride a big white horse. He was from Texas on a big white horse. Yes, I'm a long, tall Texan. I ride a big white horse. That's your horse. He rides from Texas on a big white horse. Well, I was walking down the street with my shiny badge and my spurs jang there at my feet. I seen a 